Oh. 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 Bhagavad Gita, by which Arjuna was illumined by Lord Krishna himself, and which was composed of 18 chapters within the Mahabharata by the ancient sage Vyasa. O Divine Mother, destroyer of rebirth, who showers the nectar of oneness upon us. O Bhagavad Gita, my affectionate mother, on thee I meditate. All the Upanishads are the cows. The milker is the cowherd boy, Krishna. Arjuna is the calf. And people of purified intellect are the drinkers. The milk is the supreme nectar of the Gita. My salutations to the Lord, who is the source of supreme bliss, whose grace makes the mute eloquent and the crippled cross mountains. Okay, this morning we'll complete uh, chapter 15, the Yoga of the Supreme Spirit, Purushottama. Um, and we'd actually completed the last slokas yesterday, and then there was a little discussion we were having at the, at the end of it related to this commentary on devotion, once again. And here was the, here was the shloka. Um, these two, he who undiluted knows me thus as the highest Purusha, knowing all, so knowing all, that's what there is to know, worships me with his whole being, Sarva Bhavana, O Arjuna. And then the last, last shloka, thus this most secret science has been taught by me, O sinless one, on knowing this, a man becomes wise and all his duties are accomplished. So, um, here's, the, here's the discussion we were having. The, the word worship or devote, um, and we talk about this sometimes, we all worship something. Doesn't necessarily mean something high, but we worship something higher than us. We're always trying to milk the cow. We're always trying to get something. Huh? And of course, what we're really trying to get, the essence we're trying to get is happiness. Hmm? Yeah? Cool. So we're always trying to get it. So as a result, we always imagine happiness to be apart from us. And therefore, we have to get it from somewhere because we're not experiencing it now. Right? And so that, whatever it is that we imagine it to be in, that's what we worship. Worship simply means to think about it, to contemplate about it, to engage with it, to relate to it, and to submit oneself to it. <laughs> yes? Does that make sense? Ah. So I used to worship my boss, for example. What did I want? I wanted more success, more money, more of the things that I imagined happiness to be in. Uh, and I saw him as containing that through the choices that he made, the decisions that he made, etc. I worshipped my customers because I imagined that I would get happiness from, from them giving me some milk <laughs> through orders and such. Uh, in a way, I worshipped the employees, the people that worked for me, because I imagined that their growth and success would give me more of that milk. <laughs> yes? Uh, so is, is it so? Do we see that we all worship something? Whatever. Now, let's say that you get to this place where you realize that this trifold nature of the one, that this is the truth, that this is what this really is. That here we're sitting in the wavy bit, <laughs> the, the impermanent, the manifest bit, and that actually at the same time, the unmanifest is here, 
because all of this manifest came from the unmanifest. It continues to come from the unmanifest. The thoughts right now that are coming out of here as words, they're in unmanifest until they come and I speak them. Yes? Yes. But they exist as potential. Huh? I could say anything. <laughs> yes? Right. Yeah, any thought could come to you. Is it so? Yes. Yeah, okay. So, and so, and now what's underlying that? If we get it, the substratum, and the substratum is the divine, it is what we call God or Krishna. And it's real. And this one reality permeates all. This third, by the way, is exactly what science is looking for, but you can't find it in the way they look. They're looking for the unifying theory. What is it that underlies all of this? What is the substratum? We were talking about yesterday, the, uh, the deepest aspect of the ocean, which has to be there in order to support all the activity above it. Hmm. And so now, if we get it, and we understand that everything we saw, peace, happiness, um, union, satisfaction, <laughs> exists within it, not within some object, then what do you worship? What would you logically worship? <laughs> right? You would logically worship that, your own highest self, but for the intellect to relate to it. When the intellect relates to self, it relates still to this idea of who I am. So in order to establish this relationship, the intellect really has to relate to what is highest. So light, God, whatever, whatever name is chosen. And it's just a name. This altar, this entire space is just to help us to this intellect to relate to that which is higher. Everything. They're all symbols, but they're symbols to help us to relate to what is higher. The name, the same. The form, Jesus on the cross, the same. Krishna in the battlefield, the same. Krishna in the heart, now we get closer to the mark. And here, somewhere here the form vanishes and we're left with the knowing that the formless is the underlier and I, this conscious mind, must worship that because if I worship something else, I get lost. Huh? And life becomes meaningless once again. And suffering rules the day. So I said, devotion is actually logical. When you work it out, what the Lord Krishna is sharing here, then what do you worship? You have to worship something, talking to conscious mind. You have to connect with something, and your choices are you connect with the objects or you connect with that which is the truth of all. <clears throat> the forms are many, but the truth is one. <laughs> yeah. So that's the choice. The conscious mind can't float. It can't be without a master. It will naturally go to one or the other. Hmm? And so, what do you attach it to? And that's how we get to this concept of worship. And here's the commentary from Swamiji. Knowing that God is all, the devotee worships him in all of the five bhava or attitudes. Sarva bhavana. He looks upon his parents or children, his master or servant, his friends, his beloved, and the stranger as the manifestation of God. And he regards God as all of these. Sarva Bhavana is the commandment of the Holy Bible to love thy God with all thy heart. In the heart of the devotee, there is no room for finite, imperfect, selfish, and sensuous love. He loves all, not the heterogeneous, but the homogeneous God in all. So loving all doesn't mean loving each. It doesn't mean loving to learn, learning to love each. 
one at a time. It doesn't mean that. It means relating to and worshiping the one which is appearing as the many. Hmm? The one which is appearing as the many. Steps to getting there might start with learn to love everyone though, huh? Ah, uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. What's the, you see, the tendency for us, the great tendency for us is to love in order to get something. Right? Look and see how long you love someone before you think about what are you getting back. Well, I guess accept every person. Yeah, acceptance, different acceptance, different acceptance. Word. Acceptance is a, yeah. And cultivate virtue, and that's where we're stepping into. Cultivate the divine virtues. That's really the practice. That's really the practice. Cultivate the divine virtues. And we're stepping into the next chapter is the virtues and vices, the, the divine nature and the demoniacal nature, which are both within, both within us. Mm. Um, so yeah, real love exists. You don't make it, you don't create it. Mm. When you accept someone as your own self, it naturally is there. You just have to remove the barrier. That's it. And the barriers have to do with this identification as a limited being and all of the actions, all of the desires, all of the thoughts that are rising from this. So, oh, so it's not about making yourself love someone, it's about eliminating the barrier. Mm. And then Swamiji closes his commentary. He says, if we begin with the obvious and examine the not so obvious sources of these obvious phenomena, then it is possible for us to be free from self-created problems and eventually arrive at the grand discovery of the profoundest secret. And so that closes the 15th. Thus, in the Upanishad of the glorious Bhagavad Gita, the science of the eternal, the scripture of yoga, the dialogue between Sri Krishna and Arjuna, ends the 15th discourse entitled The Yoga of the Supreme Spirit. Okay, we'll begin the 16th this morning, which is the yoga of the divine and the demoniacal. Um, Mm. There, there are said to be three natures, and it has to do also with the uh, gunas. So the divine or devi in Sanskrit, and then the, the demonical or demoniacal, which is the asura. Asura. Um, so Saturdays, the workshop, the workshop is to watch the, the Ramayana. And it's um, forever. It's been involved from, we've been involved in it more than a year now, right? Mm, yeah. I think so. It's my favorite show. <laughs> Maybe more than a year now. More than a year now, I believe. Yeah. So good. Right. We started with one and it ran out. It was only 54 episodes. So yeah, that right there was six months. <laughs> and it ran out. So we started again with a different version. It's 128 episodes. And we're a third of the way through it or halfway through it or yeah. something. So, and it's a, and it's a character play, um, but everything happening within it and the lessons are, are beautiful, but the characters are, the lead characters are, uh, divine, Devi like, or they're demoniacal, Ravana, right? So, and Asura, demonstrating really the, the, the divine nature within us and the asuric nature within us and how they're juxtaposed. And then there's a third, which is the, you could say like the, um, the hopelessly indifferent, just not caring, which is Tamas. 
um, which is called in Sanskrit Rakshasa. Rakshasa. This chapter we're entering um, actually speaks to the first two, and the reason, and not the third. And the reason is because the divine and the demoniacal, they're both doing something. <laughs> they're either acting in a divine way or they're acting in an undivine way. So it's positive motion. <laughs> positive motion can be converted to sattva. <laughs> the conversions where someone where someone gets it and turns their life around, like the, the jailhouse conversions, which really do happen, where people have this demoniacal nature and they're hurting people. And uh, the conversions are from this, the demoniacal. They're not from the ones who don't care. The ones who don't care have to be motivated to action first. So something has to happen for them. So this chapter actually relates to the to the to the two. There's an introduction here from from. Uh, oh no, should I? Good morning, Phil. <laughs> okay, where are you? There you are. So this is Swami Satchidananda he introduces. He says the 16th and 17th chapters are very important because they give so much practical advice to the spiritual seeker. Some of the other chapters are mainly theory and philosophy, but I feel, he says, we should look more for practical hints. The important question is, what should I do in my life? We all know there's something higher to be achieved. We don't have to worry about its name, where it is, whether it's a he or a she, or one or many. Mainly, it just creates problems trying to give names and forms to the nameless and formless one. God is something beyond name and form, but we have to perceive that infinite one in some name and form. There's nothing wrong in doing so. Unfortunately, many people want others also to choose the same name and form that they prefer, and there's a problem. They say, I like this name and form, so everybody should like it. And if you don't like it, I don't like you. That's the reason I don't bother much with the name or form. I just stick to the one thing. Any name or form is okay. All names are God's name. All forms are God's form, which is bingo, the kirtan that you were leading this yeah. morning. Uh, the real question is how to perceive or realize that, that, that divinity. How to perceive or realize that. Um, what should I do to get a glimpse of it? I want to experience it instead of simply playing with words, and that's the important thing. And then he introduces, he says, sadhana is the actual practice of yoga. Without sadhana, there's no accomplishment. Here in the 16th chapter, we see some of the divine qualities that every seeker should develop if he or she wants to reach that great accomplishment. And this is really, to your question, this is really what's wanting to be cultivated. Um, because if you try to cultivate love without understanding what it is, then natural, naturally attachments will form, expectations will arise, and suffering will come. Um, we have an idea of what is love. We don't actually know what it is. Um, but with the commitment to love in, a, in an all-encompassing way, then certainly that's helpful. And then some guidance will help to support it. And so you could take this chapter as guidance on how to love. How to love, how to come into this. Oh. Um, so these first three shlokas, we'll read them together. They relate to the divine qualities. So this is where Krishna starts. Blessed Lord says, Arjuna, these are the qualities of the one who will attain a divine state. The one who will attain a divine state. Not saying predestined, but the one who the one who brings these forth, 
the one who exhibits them, the one who who remakes themselves in this image, is destined for a divine state, either heaven or freedom, like that. Fearlessness, and the Sanskrit names are given, Abhaya, Abhaya. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Fearlessness. A pure thinking heart. A pure thinking heart, staying on the yoga path of wisdom, no matter what happens. Always giving generously. Control of the senses. A life of self-sacrifice. A desire to study scriptures. Acceptance of austerities, tapas, we were discussing yesterday, right? And straightforwardness. So honestly, honesty, honestly engaging. And uh, Swamiji comments on the first. He says, a true spiritual, the first being fearlessness. A true spiritual seeker who is after the truth should know no fear. Fear is a result of lack of faith. If you have total faith in that supreme power, you won't be afraid of anything. That's true. Um, in the interim, recognizing what it is that is your goal, then you have to call forth courage. You won't have fearlessness, but you have to call forth courage and do what you're afraid of anyway, right? Mm. But then you come out the other side, somehow. And you learn that when I engage in this way, nothing bad happens. Hmm. Um, that's where I joke and say, why did it take a thousand bottles of water? Um, wisdom will lead one to fearlessness as well. Why is that? Because you'll know. That, that what? What are the fears? Like not knowing yourself, death. Yeah, death, um, not being successful, not becoming happy, losing the shot at happiness, like this, right? So, so wisdom is a, is a knowledge of where these reside and a knowledge that one is not the body, correct? So when wisdom is pervading, where is the fear? No, nowhere. Nowhere to be found. So fearlessness and wisdom also go together in this way. But Swamiji is calling out uh, fearlessness in particular, encouraging us to be courageous, really. Courageous, face them. It was like the movie last night, talking about that. The hero's mm -hmm. journey. Yeah, yeah, it is. That's it. Very good. Okay, second set, uh, continuing with the virtues or the divine qualities. Not causing pain to others. Truthfulness, satyam. Never angry, always peaceful, shanti. Never speaking, um, sorry, renunciation of the fruits of your actions. And we've had a lot of discussion in this Gita study about this, tyaga. Not renouncing action. I have to say it again. <laughs> because that's the first thing we want to do when, the, when it seems like the world is against us. It's like, okay, I'm not going to do anything then. And that's where this started with Arjuna in chapter one is, right? He wants to run away. And so that desire will arise. And so the Gita is very clear about but. Renouncing action is not renunciation. Renunciation is really tyaga, renouncing the fruits of the action. Going ahead and doing, but not for yourself and not expecting the, the fruit. So that also is seen as a divine quality. Never speaking falsely or maliciously of others. Right? and not even thinking falsely or maliciously of others. There's a good one for us. That's divine quality. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Compassion for all beings, not just the ones we like. Not coveting what others have. We were discussing that yesterday in Upanishad, right? Uh, gentleness, modesty, and lack of fickleness, never fickle. And then the third set, full of vigor, always forgiving, courageous in adversity, there we go, pure of body and mind, no hatred towards anyone, and never puffed up with pride. These are the characteristics, Arjuna, of a man or woman destined for a divine life. And we'll pick up some of the commentary here. This destiny word, by the way, um, maybe we can just talk about it a little bit. In this as-if life, um, you know, there's, a, there's an absolutely beautiful talk from Thomas Merton that I'd like to share with everyone. I'll, I'll clip it and share it today in the group. I'd invite everyone to listen to it. Um, it Thomas Merton, have we heard of Thomas Merton? Some? Yes. Yeah. Thomas Merton is a, is a beautiful saint, um, born in the U.S., he was called towards to monastic life and um, Gethsemane in, I believe it's Kentucky, Kentucky yeah. was, the, was the monastery that he lived in. And they practiced silence. They practiced Mauna all of the time. But he was called upon to speak and to lead after some time. And he wrote extensively and he traveled. He, he made a great connection between the Catholic Church in the Eastern traditions and really was a trailblazer in modern times in terms of the of of the what we consider to be the Western faith of Christianity of connecting, reconnecting back with the unity of faith, the unity of, of the truth teachings. And so he got it and he wrote beautifully and and when he talks, we hear such humility in his voice. It's just beautiful to listen to him talk. And there aren't a lot of recordings of him. Um, so this one in particular, he talks about God's will and destiny. And, um, and I'll, I'll let you listen to the full of it. And it, it all, he's, he's speaking in a way where you'll really have to pay attention because he's so humble. He's, not, he's saying something very important, but he's saying it in a way that you'd have to really listen. Um, but, he, but he's talking about God's will versus destiny in a, in a way. And he says, you know, we think that God's will is, is something that we're supposed to do, some external thing. He said, that's, and that if we do the right thing, then we'll be in alignment and we'll be happy if we do the right thing. Um, what we're destined to do, what we came here to do. If we do that thing, we'll be happy. And, um, and he says that actually is more like fortune telling. Um, and, he, and he draws the comparison because everything here is contingent. Um, action in a way, you could say predestined, but in a way, it's not, because every action is leading to another action, and the result, the cumulative effect of it, is leading to a thing. But, but we harbor the idea that when the right thing happens to me, then I'll be happy. Uh, but that's not it. It, it. It's not the thing that's done. It's not even the thing that you do. It's the attitude with which we do it. <laughs> and, the, and the cumulative effect of the things we do, it, it, it leads towards what we call our destiny. Um, but destiny in that way, what will happen in the future is really meaningless. It's, a, it's just an imagination. It's a, it, 
And Uma Devi, look at how much time we focus on what will happen in the future. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And there's a curiosity about it, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Or a worry. Yeah, or a worry, indeed. Um, and how little time we focus on what attitude do I bring in this moment. Mm. Right? That's because this mind is so objectified. When really what counts is what attitude I bring in this moment, because it's the attitude I bring in this moment that writes my destiny. Mm. Yes? So it's not about when we hear the word destiny, and the, the word destiny here is just introduced, it's, it, it's not about what will happen to us. It's about what will we make of our life. And we're always, this book, we're always writing. And it's written one letter at a time based upon the attitude that we bring to this life. Yes? And what we do. And in this way, this, this divine or demoniacal plays in. Why did I say hello to you? I said hello to you. Now that plays a part of our destinies, mm. right? As soon as I say hello to you, our destinies take a turn. Huh? Now, is it destined that we say hello? Yes, I suppose. But what was the intention underlying it? That's really what writes the book. Mm. Yes? That's really it. And so in this way, when, when Swami Shivananda talks about, you know, so an action and reap a tendency, so a tendency, reap a... Reap a habit, so a habit, reap a character, so a character, reap a destiny, yes. But it's really the bhava, the bhavana that's being brought into the, into the action that's cultivating the destiny. And the destiny of one that is the, the one who brings this, this divine bhavana, who's able to tap it, bring it forward against all of the obstacles, this is the hero's journey. This is the real hero's journey. Against all of the challenges, all of the problems, all of the obstacles, is able to be balanced and present. The destiny of such a one who's able to bring this forward is freedom. Now, does that mean that they were predestined for freedom? No. It means they wrote their own book. And when they started this journey, the destiny might have been something different. It might have been continued slavery, continued bondage. Uh -huh. But something happened that looked like a problem, and it was really an opportunity. And it was shocking enough to help us to look and find something higher. And if we find it, and if we cultivate it, Yes? Yeah. Then we write our own destiny. The world doesn't write it for us any longer. Oh. So when we look at these qualities and we have the idea of destin destiny, the one who cultivates these quali qualities is destined for divinity or destined for freedom like this. It's, it, it's really an active process. And this, this chapter, as we go through it, this is the meat of the spiritual life. This is the meat of it. It's not about, do you come to the altar? Do you show up at 5 a.m., etc., etc.? It's about what's the bhavana that you're cultivating in the things that you're doing. You know, we have to do stuff. We, we get to, to do stuff. Yeah, we get to do it. Surf it's two light. attitudes. Don't drown. Yeah, one way or the other, it's needing to happen. And then what attitude? Okay.
It oh. doesn't come down to which voice you listen to. Because, for example, this morning when I was, I knew it was Krishna Day, and I knew that you were probably <laughs> going to pick me, so I started grabbing the book right away. And I thought, oh, good, Krishna Day, because um, when I was at the LA Center, we always had puja on Wednesdays, so we never did Krishna songs. I'm always excited to do Krishna. And I, I was leafing through it, and I looked at two or three other ones. Yes. And I, I asked, I said, which one should I do today? And I went to Raghupati Raghupati uh, that one. And, I, and then I turned the page again because I didn't want to do that one. And then I, I, the boy, I came back to it. <laughs> and all of a sudden it was like, do this one. And now I understand why because of what we were talking about. Because of the chapter, discussion chapter, now. Yeah. So oh. it's very interesting. Oh. <laughs> I guess oh. I was, oh. I, don't know, I don't know if that's destined to do that. But <laughs> <laughs> on, on the voice that I listened to, it was like this one, not this one. So, yeah. Well, and at the, and, and, you know, just on the concept, <laughs> in the same way, destiny is not even applying to the things that happen, right? Or the things that you do, um, where, where it's fluid and where you clearly have free will is the attitudes that you choose and, the, and what it is that you worship. Right. The voice you listen to. The voice yeah. You listen to. Yeah. 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 One, one that I was practicing or still practicing was... Um, Switching the word afraid or scared with excited. Uh. And um, because it's it's a bunch of emotions and the word is associated with something negative that's like hindering. Yes. Um, and I would tell you to, re you might choose to replace excited with happy. Happy to do. Uh, happy implies a, a more balanced attitude with it and the thing about excitement is it's always followed by the crash mm -hmm. well because well at this point it's a, it, it's a stimulating thing that's overwhelming yeah. and it's associated with something negative yeah. so trying to just and turn you're it wanting to turn it not, positive yeah 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 and just but once no that's the next step that's <laughs> okay rajas. oh rajas. but that's but happy. you're cultivating rajas and that's great so happy yeah. <laughs> we're not correcting <laughs> we're saying cool if I can insert happy and think of it as opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh. so happy. Beautiful. Be, happy to be Sapa in this illustration. Yeah. 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 Um, but beautiful. It's good. You see it. It's turning the mind, isn't it? Changing the attitude towards the thing. So, and you Alan see how Watts, it changes the experience. He makes this comment about like, he's like, there's two ways you can live your life. You could live it like, <laughs> Or yes. you could live it like, zing! Yes. It's like, how do you want to do it? Oh, there you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Trina, with your service, you're given a beautiful opportunity for all of this, aren't you, dear? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's an intense experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Intense. Oh, I'm sorry. What your service. Mean? The My school. Service at the school. Yeah. Yes. So you have the opportunity to choose what it is. Right. Yeah. Oh. Okay, let's close with the final prayers in RT, page 174. Om. Om Triambakam Orai rukme vabandinan, mrechor mukshiyaman mrechat. Om chayamba kamya jamehe, surandim pushti vardhanam. Orai rukme vabandinan, mrechor mukshiyaman mrechat. Om chayamba kamya jamehe, surandim pushti vardhanam. Orai rukme vabandinan, Mritor Mukshya Man Mritat Om Sarve Sham Swastir Bhavatu Sarve Sham Shantir Bhavatu Sarve Sham Purnam Bhavatu Sarve Sham Mangalam Bhavatu Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Shantu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashanto Makashi Tukabhakave Asatoma Satgamaya, Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya, 
Mrityoy ma'am mritam gamaya Om Poynamada Poynamidam Poyna Poynamudashate Poynasya Poynamadaya Poynameva Vasishate Om Shanti 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 O adorable Lord of mercy and love, salutations and prostrations unto thee. Thou art omnipresent, omnipotent, and omniscient. Thou art Satchitananda. Thou art existence, knowledge, and bliss absolute. Thou art the indweller of all beings. Grant us an understanding heart, equal vision, balanced mind, faith, devotion, and wisdom. Grant us inner spiritual strength to resist temptation and to control the mind. Free us from egoism, lust, anger, greed, hatred, and jealousy. Fill our hearts with divine virtues. Let us behold thee in all these names and forms. Let us serve thee in all these names and forms. Let us ever remember thee. Let us ever sing thy glories. Let thy name be ever on our lips. Let us abide in thee forever and ever. And for all the saints and sages of all the traditions. That's right for our teeth.